being in the pews like we are, I don't have to tell everybody you're going to need a Bible this evening because they're right there for you. That's right. There's a handout. I haven't handed it out yet. It's right here. You're welcome. Certainly. All right, well, good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get rolling. It's 5.30, and we have a brand new topic before us this evening. How many of you had a chance to actually get a copy of the book and read the introduction? Okay, just a couple of you tonight. All right, then we can work with that. We'll summarize a little bit more of what was in the introduction. Um, the homework for next week is to read the first chapter, so, um, but that's all right. We can certainly make do with what we have this evening. The handout, um, there's kind of a study guide that goes all the way through this book. Um, the book is from Concordia Publishing House. Um, our synod's publisher and the publish, uh, sorry, the study guide is also from our, our synod's publishing house. So they have that available on their website. That's where I printed these off from. So these are the kinds of things that we'll be going through. It's hard to remember who all comes to what Bible study, um, but it was about a year ago now we did a book study on Already Gone. Um, I remember you were at that one. Um, the Giordano's, I remember, had gone to that one. How many of you had a chance to read that book, Already Gone? So, in some ways, if you read that book, this book is going to remind you of it. It's a completely different take on the same issue. What's happening to the church? Why are people disappearing from our churches? Um, in a sense, this book covers that same thing, except for, rather than from uh, the Baptist perspective that you get with Ken Ham, this is going to come at it from the Lutheran perspective. It's going to be much more cross-focused, um, although Ken Ham does a pretty good job uh, doing that in his work. So, broken, seven Christian rules that every Christian ought to break as often as possible. As you can see on your handout, um, the introduction is titled, What Up?, which might make you wonder what the book is like. Uh, but Pastor Jonathan Fisk is the author, author of this book. Um, he is in his 30s, been a pastor in the LCMS for uh, many years already, and is serving a congregation. I was just corrected on this this afternoon. He's serving a congregation in North Dakota. Uh, I get my Dakotas confused all the time. So he's, he's out that way. He's previously served a congregation in Chicago, and before that he was in Pennsylvania. Um, so he and his family are enjoying North Dakota these days. He wrote this book a few years ago. Uh, sounds like he's got another book he's working on right now. I couldn't tell you anything about it, but if I find out more and you enjoy this one, I'll let you know. Um, to give you kind of a taste of what his writing style is like, if you were at that Bible study we did where we watched the video downstairs, um, what was it called? Not Until I Say I Do. Um, that video, that podcast that we watched, that's him. Pastor Jonathan Fisk, who did that video, is the guy who wrote this book. Um, so his writing style is a little different than maybe the things that you're used to reading, but it's a, it's a worthwhile read. Um, what he has to say is, is very valuable to us, and we're gonna kinda cover through some of that here this evening. So the first couple of things here, again, the title of the introduction is What Up? Um, Punk Rock John and the Enslaving Ex-Christianity of Death. Um, it's a really strange subtitle to your introduction. We'll get to that. As you begin, there's two terms he wants you to know this evening. Uh, those are enthusiasm and postmodernism. Are, are you familiar with either of those terms? Okay, so the, the, the visiting pastor that is with us and his daughter are familiar with those terms. 
since you've read it, you, you are at least familiar with the terms. And by enthusiasm, it's not the enthusiasm you're thinking of if you're not uh, familiar with what he's getting at. We'll talk about that here again in just a little bit. So um, we're going to go through it, and then after we've gone through it, um, for the couple of you that have read it, I'll kind of open it up and see if what maybe your thoughts were on some of the different things he was talking about, um, or if there were any quotes that really jumped out to you, because there, there's a lot of quotables. So he's, he's got some good stuff he's got in here. So if we look at the, the handout, then the first discussion question. In the story of Punk Rock John, and I'm going to summarize that story for you in just a minute um, after we read the question for those who haven't read it. We see a young man who is distraught and seeking for advice in spiritual matters. His youth leader told him to seek God in prayer. Read John 5, 37 to 40, and John 14, 16 through 24. Where should the leader have pointed punk rock John for answers? So go ahead and get those Bibles open to John chapter 5. While you're doing this, I mean, this is only a couple of pages here, so... While you search for those, I'm going to go ahead and read the story of Punk Rock John rather than try to summarize it for you. So the book begins with this story. He was a good kid. He played in a punk rock band and worshipped with punk rock style. He was a good kid. He didn't just go to church, but he was a Christian, on fire and unafraid to step out of the box for Jesus. That was what the church needed, less fear, less hesitancy, more living by the Spirit, more real religion. He was a good kid. He played in a Christian band. He hung out with Christian friends. He lived the Christian life. He worked hard to get people saved. He struggled after God's will for his life. He set aside time for prayer. He set aside time to play his guitar. He mixed the two together and sang out songs of praise to his heart's content. Soon he'd go to college, then he'd marry his girlfriend. Maybe he'd be a pastor, maybe he'd be a worship leader. All he knew was that what he wanted for the rest of his life was to feel this way, to live this life, to know what he knew, and to find a way to help more people do the same. Then he met a missionary. It all started innocently enough. He was online the way he often was, surfing the punk rock forum in search of a new chord progression. He clicked a link. It took him to a punk rock site. I'm going to draw the symbol. That's not the Avengers logo. Um, What sign is that for? Yeah, anarchy. I apologize if it's not the greatest anarchy sign you've ever seen. Yeah, there was a anarchy sign in the corner and a pretty girl with blue hair in the sidebar. No biggie, he'd been on these sites before. This was the punk rock world, nothing wrong with it. Well, there were all sorts of things wrong with it. That's why he played Christian punk rock. But there really wasn't anything wrong with blue hair or sweet riffs. He was about to click back when something else caught his eye. Not the girl or the paraphernalia, but some words. Words he didn't like, words that made him angry, words that made him click the link. Christian punks are posers. Do I have to describe what a poser is? I'm not sure if everybody generationally understands that term, so. Yeah, uh, they're pretending to be something they're not. Um, Little children today, at least they did in my generation, would run around and when they wanted to insult somebody, they'd call them a poser. Um, I don't know if little children do that today or not. Anyway, it was written by the missionary. It was written with passion and zeal, but it was the wrong mission. The missionary said Christian punk rock was a lie. True punk rock was anti-authority, anti-prejudice, anti-conformity, anti-establishment, and what could be a more authoritative, prejudiced, conformist establishment than Christianity? What was more, the missionary said, Christians were all idiots living in a total delusion about reality. They didn't just deny science, they based all their decisions on feelings and blindness. He was a good kid. He wanted his heart to break over how wrong that missionary was, but 
What scared him more than anything ever had, what terrified him till his pulse quickened, was that his heart wasn't breaking the way it should. He wasn't feeling the way he was supposed to feel. Instead, he was thinking the things he wasn't supposed to think. The missionary made sense. The missionary sounded right. He turned off the computer as fast as he could. He got out his Bible and he tried to pray. It was always hard to pray because the emotions never came easily. That's why he needed music for the emotions. He tried to pray, but the feelings didn't come. God, are you, he- are you here? Are you there? He asked. It wasn't long before he was back on the same site reading more. It was like a light had dawned. He started posting in the forum, asking questions, looking for guidance. He learned a lot in the next few months. He watched Zeitgeist, the movie on YouTube, and learned from it that Jesus was just another version of the pagan gods. He read about Martin Luther and how he was a Nazi. You all knew that, right? That's covered in the rest of the chapter, but you can catch up. He wanted to stop. He wanted to find something to tell him what he read was wrong. So he went and talked to his youth pastor. I think I'm becoming an atheist, he confessed, in the eerily warm stuffiness of the office, sweat beating uncomfortably under his arms. The couch had always felt so welcoming and hip, but now it felt too large. He was sinking in it. He wished he could sink in it and hide I found all these arguments on the internet. They make a lot of sense. I don't know what to do. I don't want to be an atheist. I used to be on fire. What happened? I don't understand. Is there sin you've been hiding? The youth pastor asked. No, he said right away. He felt guilty saying no, even though he couldn't think of a good reason for it. Maybe he did have hidden sin. I just need answers, he said, shoving the thought away. I learned that Christmas is just Roman sun worship and that our church body is sexist. I don't know what to think or feel. I understand, the youth pastor said, there are a lot of Satan's messengers out there. They will say all sorts of worldly things to plant doubts in you. You just can't trust them. But how can I know that? How do I even know that God is there? Just look at the world. How could it exist without God? I don't know. Evolution? Listen, God loves you. He wants you to have a good life full of purpose and meaning. Trust me, just pray about it. God will give you the answer you need. But I have prayed. Pray more. God loves you. He will answer. But God didn't answer. He was still a good kid, but now he was an atheist. He got rid of his Christian t-shirts, deleted his Christian punk rock MP3s, It took him a while, but he eventually told his parents. They took it hard. He understood, but they were deceived. They believed in faith, but faith didn't have answers. Science had answers. Now he had answers too. And he had a new community that supported him, accepted him for who he was without insisting he conform to their standards. But weren't you on fire for Jesus? I thought I was, but it was just a show. It was just make-believe. He was a good kid, but his faith in Christianity was broken. So that's Punk Rock John that the, the book introduces you to, starts off that way. You then learn in the rest of the introduction that this is just a made up scenario. However, as a pastor, Um, He has seen that in any number of different ways already in his ministry. Um, I've seen that play out as well. Um, Many of you probably have seen that play out as well. So let's read uh, from John chapter 5. If somebody has that and wants to read for us, John chapter 5 starting at verse 37. Thank you, and then flip to John 14. We'll read that one as well. Uh, 
Again, the question is, where should the youth leader have been pointing John? So as we read through these, these couple of scripture passages, think that one through. All right, thank you. So as we, we reflect on punk rock John, what would you say the basis of John's faith had been? His feelings. Yeah, his feelings. Um, even when he prayed, the prayer wasn't enough. He had to have music to go along with it so that he could feel it, okay? That's probably... The, the, the fullness, I mean, really the best answer to that. How easily was his faith undermined? Yeah, yeah, in, in John's case, it was just one website um, and a couple of random strung together sentences by whoever the, the writer was. But it's really in terms of looking at it on the larger scale, it's, it was one question or a couple of questions that he, John just didn't have a response to and it started to eat at him and it started to eat at him some more and he didn't know, know where to turn with that and I'm going to get anarchy off of our board. <laughs> could be, and there's plenty of people out there that think like that. I want to be a Christian, but I don't really like what the church is doing. Um, there's entire books written on it. I've got one in my office. I think it's titled, They Love Jesus, But Not the Church, or something like that, which is, if you actually love Jesus and know his word, like we were just reading about in John, you would know that, that that's an oxymoron, and it just doesn't work that way. Um, so... It turned out to be, at least it turned out to be easy enough to destroy. Um, so, where should the question question number one? Where should the youth pastor have been pointing John for his answer? To the word. Okay, to the word, which there was nothing of in in that pastor's answer. How'd that pa- pastor do, by the way? and his, his handling of his youth. Any of you think he did well? But that's common. I mean, so many across the church, and it's not pastors alone, but so many that are respected and looked up to as mentors and leaders have no kind of training. They don't know where to go even themselves, let alone where to point someone else. Um, 
Pastor Fist didn't give up, didn't give this made up character a, a deeper background. So we don't know what church he's coming from or what theological training that pastor supposedly had. Um, it's just an illustration, but it does happen. Even in our own community here, Stewartville, churches around you here in town have people that they call pastor who have no training. They just wanted to be pastor and thought they could. And the congregation kind of lifted them up in that role. Yep. Yeah, and we, we give wrong answers. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. I make mistakes. I'm human. Uh, we had some of that conversation just this morning. Um, but, you know, the idea of, yeah, follow up with somebody, but to just kind of, it seemed like blow them off almost in this, this example. But again, these things happen. Well, he didn't ask any questions. Yeah, he... he Mm-hmm. the reasons why he was feeling the way he was feeling and, and making the choice he was making. Yeah, there were no further questions, no delving deeper, you know, okay, you say, you say you're thinking you're becoming an atheist, what's going on? Where did this come from? Why is this happening all of a sudden? And, and be able to unpack, there was none of that in that conversation, sure. Um, but at the same time, what was the answer that this youth pastor was giving? Where was he telling this young man to turn? to find his answers. To turn to prayer, we all know God answers prayer, right? Have you? Well, sometimes not very quickly, but I don't know, um, not audibly usually either. I mean, it's not like you go home and you get on your knees in your bedroom and pray and then suddenly God is just speaking to you in words that you can hear through your ears. And that's why the correct answer that had already been mentioned was the word. Because in the word, God already has answered the very questions that Punk Rock John was struggling with. Um, the handout that I have for this to go along with the questions mentions, this would have been a great chance to actually talk about apologetics. To go into, you know, we actually have evidence that says Jesus rose from the grave and start talking about those kinds of things. Use the word of God to actually support the faith. So, all right. Question number two gets into the next section of the introduction, which was titled Dirty Crow Tricks. You know what crows do, so I don't have to explain that one. All right, uh, in the section Dirty Crow Tricks, Dr. Luther points out that enthusiasm always has been and always will be at the heart of unbelief. If you have a book of Concord, read the small called articles, number three, section eight, uh, lines nine through 13. Why is Luther so hard on enthusiasm? How does 2 Timothy 3, chapter six through eight, affirm this teaching by Dr. Luther? All right, so several things. First, um, the introduction does give you a definition for enthusiasm. So let me read that for you. Um, My notes do it. Martin Luther once wrote that the old serpent, the devil, first converted Adam and Eve to unbelief by making them enthusiasts. By enthusiast, he meant that the devil convinced them that the real source of goodness was not in God's word, it was in themselves. Do you see that? What does he mean by the source of goodness was in Adam and Eve, that it was in themselves? That surely, you can, surely God wants you to be like him and to know everything. 
Yeah, that, in that case, it then got based on their knowledge. By eating the fruit of this tree, you will be able to know good and evil. And suddenly it was turned inward. It was turned in on themselves. It continued, they should be enthusiastic about their own abilities to discern good and evil, to learn of it, and to rule by it. Then quoting from another section of the small called articles, the old devil led them away from God's outward word to spiritualizing and self-pride, and yet he did this through other outward words. All right, so if you're not already on your way to the Timothy passage, I'm going to read the paragraph that was referenced in the, the book of Concord for you, because I don't expect that you all brought your books of Concord along this evening, right? All right, so... Um, if you're, you know, following along. In short, enthusiasm clings to Adam and his children from the beginning to the end of the world, fed and spread among them as poison by the old dragon, Satan, the serpent from the garden. It is the source, power, and might of all heresies, even that of the papacy and Mohammed. So Luther has now just pointed to the Catholic Church, and to Islam. Therefore, we should and must insist that God does not want to deal with us human beings except by means of his external word and sacrament. Everything that boasts of being from the Spirit apart from such a word and sacrament is of the devil. For God even desired to appear to Moses first in the burning bush and by means of the spoken word. No prophet, not even Elijah or Elisha, receive the Spirit outside of or without the Ten Commandments. John the Baptist was not conceived without Gabriel's preceding word, nor did he leap in his mother's womb without Mary's voice. And St. Peter says, the prophets did not prophesy by human will, but by the Holy Spirit, indeed, as holy people of God. However, without the external word, they were not holy, much less would the Holy Spirit have moved them to speak while they were still unholy. Peter says they were holy because the Holy Spirit speaks through them. All right, and then we are in 2 Timothy. Somebody have that reading? I want to read that for us. Jambers. All right, so the question here is, why is Luther so hard on enthusiasm? That's the first half of the question. In some ways, yeah, that's, that's more closer to what we normally think of as enthusiasm, which is, well, enthusiastic. You think of somebody that's all happily, happy and bubbly about something. Um, they're really excited, um, which is definitely attached to feelings and is part of this. Um, the way we're defining enthusiasm here is that it's anything that points away from the Word of God. So it points you to something else. Um, in the case that was used as an example already um, in the in the book there was knowledge, which some cultures have connected with feelings, but we generally don't as Americans. Well, enthusiasm was the, was the first tool used by the devil, um, and it's the one he continues to use. It's, it's his strongest tool, perhaps. Well, the book is going to explore how everything the devil does is just the same trick, right. and he just reuses it and repackages it in different ways. Um, but it seems that it works so well. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. it makes us think we can do something that we can't. 
yeah, it makes us think we can do it ourselves, whether that's through our feelings and emotions or if it's through our knowledge or if it's through our actions and works. Um, all these different things are going to be showing up as we go through this book. Um, the, the note that I have here is that enthusiasm is always pointing people away from the word of God rather than to the word of God, much like what this youth pastor had done with John. He pointed him away from God's word and rather to his own actions um, for it. With the result being that the object of our faith is removed. Once that's removed, saving faith slowly withers away or is placed into idols. All right, so the second part of the question then on number two is how does 2 Timothy chapter three affirm the teaching of Dr. Luther that we read from the small called articles? Yeah, they they are verse seven. They're never able to acknowledge the truth, even though they're always learning. Never able to acknowledge truth. Um, back to what Steve was saying is there in verse six. They're swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Um, they're moved by emotions, feelings, desires. Um, verse eight. So also these men oppose the truth, men of depraved minds, who as far as faith is concerned are rejected. That is, they're outside of faith. And this is Paul saying that. They're not followers of Christ. They're not in our brotherhood. Watch out for them, which is quite a bit of what Paul's writing to Timothy in both letters. Okay. Yeah, and the power of darkness we could all identify as being, yeah, Satan, uh, who temporarily will lend his limited power to people to get them to turn away from God. Um, yeah, I hadn't heard that of, of these two people, but very good, thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, pointing people, deceiving them uh, through passions, emotions, desires. All right, um, the third question moves into the third section of the introduction, which was titled Famished. In the section Famished, we learn about some of the struggles the church has faced in the transition from the modern age to the postmodern age. Is everyone here familiar with those two concepts, modern and postmodern? Postmodern gets thrown around a lot. Some people even say we're post postmodern now, and I'm not sure what that one means yet. But um, just as a kind of a brief recap, quickly, um, he does define postmodernism for you in the book. Um, I'll just read his definition here: the dominant philosophical system of the 21st century American thought, combining multiple previous systems of thought under the central notion that all methods of thinking are merely constructions of a culture holding in themselves no universal meaning, where the modern man would say, truth is always true. The postmodern would say, truth is always and only your opinion. So postmodernism teaches that you can't well, it teaches there is no absolute truth, which is an interesting concept because that very statement would be an absolute truth if it were true, but it's not true. Um, but that's a whole different kind of side conversation. So postmodernism 
um, has led to this idea that whatever is true for you is true for you. Whatever you want to believe, you know, if it's not hurting someone else, you're free to do whatever you want. Have you seen that in American culture? As long as it makes you comfortable, it's good. Yeah, as long as you're comfortable with it, go for it. Yeah, that's, that's the postmodern mindset, the postmodern worldview that's all around us. That's going to be part and parcel of this whole thing, too. Um, so, back to the question here. The most common answer to the various struggles is rely on yourself or we need to fix it. So we're str- the church is struggling with these, the transition from these. So what do we do? Rely on yourself to get out of it. We need to fix the problem or different uh, answers. Having talked about what we talked about tonight already, what's wrong with those two answers? Yeah, who, who is it relying on? relying on me. The church is broken. We need to fix the church. Is leaving who out? Yeah, it's it's leaving God out um, is the point. Read Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 through 9. Discuss how Jesus' parable warns us about such answers. After that, read Amos 8, 11 to 14 and answer the question, what are people really starving for? So, um, turning to Matthew chapter 13 first. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. All right, thank you. It's a parable you're all very familiar with. Um, one of the more common ones in terms of what we talk about usually when we talk about Jesus' parables. The parable of um, the sower, as we call it. So you have the four different types of soil. And we're not going to get too in-depth into this parable because you could go all kinds of uh, hours talking about all the ins and outs of a parable. Um, but, you know, so we have a very generous farmer who's just, you know, as we would look at it, Uh, wasting his seed by throwing it in places that couldn't possibly grow. But that's part of the the generous grace of God as he is abundantly sowing his seed everywhere. Um, As we dig in here, though, the the question at hand, how is it warning us about answers like we need to fix it or we have to rely on ourselves? What do you think? trying to figure out who you are. You are, you're the plant. The plant? Yeah. Well, it doesn't make, I have just been thrown on the ground. I have no, I have no recourse where I fall. Yeah, you have, you have no action in this. I mean, an easy illustration to use, since there's two little children with us, is a little child. What role does a child have in growing? Yeah, they can't. They don't control their growth. I guess if you start smoking, you can stunt your growth. But you have no control over how your body will grow. Um, You know, God simply does that. That's part of the wonders of his creation and, you know, first article kinds of stuff, the good things God has done for us. And that's what we're seeing here, too, in this, with this parable about, you know, trying to do it ourselves. If we try to do it ourselves, rely on ourselves, you know, we see the possible outcomes here. Um, The little note I have talks about how the crow will just come and snatch you up, and then off you go, and you're going to be consumed, right? The crow's not just going to steal it and drop it somewhere else. He's hungry. So, all right. um, Amos chapter 8 
probably the hardest of the texts that we've had to look for. See how well you know your minor prophets. Bruce is already there. All right. Amos chapter 8, page 1430. For those of you who haven't found it yet, uh, Bruce, you want to read it? So the question, what are people really starving for, according to Amos, would be what? Yeah, there's a famine of the Word of God. Not because the Word of God isn't available, but because we choose to either destroy it or ignore it, or whatever the case may be. You could try to plug that back into the Matthew parable if you want, but again, just end up spending all night talking about that parable. So we're not going to do that. Um, Amos is getting at this point. There's a famine for God's word. There's a hunger around this. Um, People are filling it with other things, but there is indeed a famine for it. Before we flip your, uh, no, yours is all one-sided. Before we move on to question four, I want to catch up on a couple of the little notes that I had made. I wanted to share this paragraph in particular. Our world has always been insane. Previous ages were tough, there is nothing new under the sun, and the heart of man is always and only continually evil from youth. But there is something doubly gnarly about our wild western civilization of the 21st century. A cultural perfect storm shreds the spiritual landscape of the United States. It blows on the winds of a growing ignorance of history and the Bible. It drips with the dew of an insatiable appetite for entertainment and leisure. It billows on the clouds of a mounting desperation for success, even as civilization slips into streamlined decline. Into this chaos, the remnant of the church of Jesus Christ stumbles. So I highlighted that paragraph because that was a part of question three here. We learn about the struggles the Christian church faces in transitioning from the modern to the postmodern age. That paragraph helps us to hear those struggles that he's talking about. So we have a a culture that wants to do nothing but entertain itself. I mean, you're aware of that. Um, Most homes in America have a little shrine set up. Well, I shouldn't even say little. A very large shrine set up to personal, private entertainment. Um, Leisure. I've heard um, discussions from others about how we we find ourselves quarreling over how much time of a week we should be resting when other cultures in the world have simply been working the field to the bone attempting to survive. Um, And the question wasn't even a question for them. Um, And here we are trying to decide how many hours it's okay to watch our television in a week before we've rested too much. Um, Different different world here. Um, Certainly a Ignorance of history. I mean, really, people claim Jesus never even lived. That's ignorance of history. We have proof of Jesus living at the very least. Even if they want to say he didn't rise from the grave, we have proof he lived. Um, So ignorance of history. Ignorance of the Bible. I don't There's a lot of that. Hard to even talk. Hard to have a theological conversation with somebody of any kind um, without them just showing that the word of God means nothing to them, uh, which is sad. I think that happens when the only thing that is, the only thing that comes out of someone's mouth, and it could be a televangelist, it could be a, a, a preacher in a church, it could be just a friend, is just words, just spouting Bible verses. 
Bible verse after Bible verse after Bible verse with no context, no thought of, of why that was being said or how that applies um, historically. And I, yeah. I think we have seen an awful lot of that in the last few years particularly. We snipped apart our Bible into tiny little segments. Um, sometimes I wonder if we wouldn't be better off going back and erasing all these little numbers that are there and just allowing it to be the Bible again and sit there in its context. But I understand why they're there, but we do abuse it quite a bit. Um, the, the culture billows on the clouds of a mounting desperation for success. The old American dream was what? Yeah, you have your own house with the white picket fence, maybe, you know, a spouse, a couple of kids, a dog in the yard. You were successful. You were, you were good to go. Um, that's no longer the American dream, but that's a different thing altogether. Into this chaos, the remnant of the church of Jesus Christ stumbles. So, the church in America is being faced with this cultural landscape. And again, there's gonna be more time to talk about some of this. The rest of that page, he's gonna end up actually using an analogy of the church being like a drunken woman. Um, the church is, is the church actually communicating to the culture or is the church just, well, dancing like a drunken woman and trying to draw attention to herself. Um, by and large, he'll argue it's the latter. Um, and it's a sound argument. Another paragraph that I had highlighted for myself is on page 17 of the book. Um, and it's because this is the point of the book. For all the perfect storm of our hypercultural age, for all the distractions and amusements and cares of this American life, for all the scorching pressures of conforming to the modern world and the postmodern mind, it is still only the one foil that the devil is using to attack the faith. It's the same foil the youth pastor unwittingly taught to punk rock John as if it were God's own gospel truth. It's the same foil countless well-meaning Christian pastors preach and Christian people try a little harder to believe every single week. It is the lie that God wants you to find him somewhere other than in his word. I'm gonna repeat that sentence again because that's the point. This is the whole point. It is the lie that God wants you to find him somewhere other than in his word. Every chapter for the rest of this book is going to show a different way that that lie has been used in the church and it's going to give us, it's gonna challenge that and it's gonna give us ways to push back against it, to overcome the lie. I'll give you a hint, as you know, Christ-centered, cross-centered folks, it's gonna have a lot to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified for the forgiveness of your sins and the resurrection of Christ from the grave to give you new life. That's gonna be all throughout this book. You're, you'll see it more often than, than you would if you were reading from somebody else. Um, And one other one that I wanted to read before we go on to question number four. The quote I have here from him is, this is how you risk losing your faith, a superficial spirituality filled with words that are not the words of the Bible is a counterfeit Christianity. So you can think about that one, we won't discuss it. But on to question four here. The next section of the introduction was titled The Golden Cow's New Clothes. You know more about that than you think you know about it. So the first part, the golden cow, refers to what? The emperor's new clothes. <laughs> You're getting, hey, that's the second part. The golden cow refers to what? <laughs> yeah, the golden calf and the people's desire to worship something other than God, an idol. And then yes, the new clothes is a reference to the old story that you're all familiar with, um, the emperor's new clothes. That story is printed out in the book for you so you can read it. 
Um, any of you not familiar with that story? Yeah. That's, uh, thanks, dear. Uh, yeah, our daughters don't know that one yet. So the idea is a, an emperor wants to have the, the greatest wardrobe ever. And so he's willing to pay any sum of money and he contracts these two, um, well, weavers to make him this exquisite, exquisite outfit to wear around. The weavers, what lying crooks they were, uh, they come up with this idea that they would create something uh, that only the best people of the world would be able to see. So it would expose liars and fools it would show you who true royal people were because royalty would be able to see this, of course. Um, the foolish emperor buys it. The weavers weave the outfit and they bring it to the emperor. And of course, the emperor can't see it because it's not there. And he, but he is convinced that he must have this and that he's got to you know, in order to be one of the, the best, he has to be able to see it. So he pretends, oh, what a magnificent outfit you've created. And his, his royal court, of course, does what? Yeah, they all agree with him. And then he goes out and has a parade, and what happens? Yeah, you've got the little kid in the crowd who's laughing and giggling and pointing at the naked emperor, wondering why the emperor has no clothing on. We won't get into age of accountability stuff. That's not the point. Um, but I did want to read this paragraph to you of how he unpacks that and why he's using it. The classic tale by Hans Christian Andersen is not supposed to be about Christianity, but it is. It is the tale of a Christianity that has forgotten her first love because her first love was stolen by thieves and liars. It is the tale of countless faithful Christians who feel in their gut something is terribly wrong, but who are frozen into silence by the fact that everyone else, just like them, is pretending not to notice. It is a tale of blindness, arrogance, and paranoia, of teachers who don't teach, and believers left with nothing to believe. It is a tale of willful ignorance, of failure to face the cold truth about the situation and of the refusal to repent. And it is the tale of a child's faith, the simple, wonderful, naive gift of calling a thing what it is. It's a cutting paragraph. Um, it's a cutting illustration. It's a great example if we sit and think about it and talk about it. Um, question number four, looking at our discussion guide. In the golden cow's new clothes, the story of the emperor's new clothes teaches us how people can be willfully ignorant, preferring to trust in their own idols to trusting in God. Second Peter chapter three, one to seven, talks about how in these latter days, people would scoff at ideas like the Genesis flood. We know that today in America, people, people scoff at the flood, at a six-day creation, at traditional marriage, and even at baptismal regeneration and the bodily presence of Christ in the sacrament. According to Peter's text, why are people willfully ignorant? So 2 Peter chapter 3. I will, I'll go ahead and read it for sake of, of time here. Uh, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as a reminder to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? You ever heard that one? You know, it's been 2,000 years. Where is this coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. 
but they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So according to Peter's text, why are people willfully ignorant? Yeah, I'm going to couple those two together. They forget the word and they're following after their own desires. Um, that's what most of the Old Testament's about. But um, So that's one half of the puzzle here. They, they ignore the word of God. The second part, which is getting into the latter, by the same word, uh, well, by what the word is doing. We see that in verses 5 through 7 here. You know, The word of God itself has power, and that's being ignored. The willfully ignorant not only don't know God's word, they reject the idea that God's word could possibly do something. That plays back into what had been said in number four. We know that today in America, people scoff at the flood because God couldn't possibly do that. At a six-day creation, because God couldn't possibly say, let there be light and, well, there'd be light. At traditional marriage, because God certainly did not say that uh, in Genesis 2.24, and even at baptismal regeneration in the bodily presence of Christ in the sacrament, even within the church, these issues, every one of them, all five of those things, I think it was five, every one of those things that he just listed there is rejected in some way, shape, or form by some church in America that claims Christianity. Christ couldn't possibly be both in heaven seated at the right hand of God and in the the bread and wine on the altar. He couldn't possibly be in both places. It's just bread and wine. Just do it in remembrance. There's any number of Christian churches that teach that. Jesus isn't here. He's seated with God and you just do it in remembrance. The power of God's word is ignored. First Peter chapter two. Second Peter two, one to three. Importantly, you'll, you'll donate your money to me. <laughs> um, no, the, the greed thing, the, the idea of, and Tom, you, you said it really well um, near the end of what you were saying when you said, so they can keep living the life that they want to live. Um, and the book top touched on that with John. Um, at the end of John's story that we get from John, he ends up saying that it was all make-believe, um, and he's going to 
do something where he doesn't have to conform to their way of living. One of the presentations that I heard, it's uh, the, the conference that I went to, not this past week, but the week before um, at the seminary, the, the pastor that led the presentation admitted when he stood before us, and apparently he has a reputation for this, he admitted that his, his topic was gonna be confrontational. He was trying to push our buttons, that was his goal. Um, but he ended up putting the American worldview on the board, and then he ended up putting the worldview of Jesus that you get from Jesus if you read through the Gospels, he put that on the board, and he showed how they were in an entire contradiction to one another. And he started talking about the idea that we can't serve two masters. Um, which specifically Jesus was talking about, you know, God and money, but at the same time, what he had uh, made, made a whole lot of sense. It was a very challenging presentation, like he said it would be. I uh, hope to be able to share that with you in the future, actually, because um, I thought it was worthwhile to at least think through. Um, challenges us in much of what we do and teach and believe the way we live. So it was good for that. Um, a couple of last things here. We'll try and get through number five quickly. Glance over the last four paragraphs of the introduction and then compare them to what the Bible says in James chapter one, verses 12 to 18. Who is the real threat to your faith and why? So go ahead and and flip uh, to that section. I'm going to read for you um, from the introduction while you do that. Um, Pastor Fisk writes, in this book I will dissect this tactic of the thief. We will look at how the devil uses such good gifts from God as your heart, your mind, and your hands to try to trick you into placing your trust not in God but in yourself. We will explore the seven counterfeit Christian rules, that was in brackets, that he tries to play off as if they were authentic Christianity. We will expose these rules as patterns of thinking that try to break your faith in Christianity by creating doubt. We will call these philosophical systems what they are, lies. And then we will challenge those lies with the truth given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. The crow comes calling, promising you freedom, but telling you that you must earn it. He promises you supernatural wisdom, but tells you that you must figure it out. He promises you comfort, but insists that you find it inside yourself. He tells you that you're just on the other side of glory if only you can create it. He offers you the world, but he leaves you hanging on a cross all by yourself, fed up with it all, and wondering in anger and frustration where Jesus is. He was supposed to make it all better. He does this the only way that he can. He steals Jesus' words and he uses you to do it. I am not going to let that happen. The house may have grown dirty, but we are going to sweep it clean. And once we do, we're not going to leave it empty so the one-trick pony can slip in and start excreting his filth all over again. Oh no, we are not going to reduce this good news to a one-hit wonder. Under the cross of Jesus, we will find emotion kindled on a fire that doesn't burn out. In the resurrection of Jesus, we will find a good reason for faith that answers the toughest questions. In the pure word of God, we will find true purpose for our lives built on a foundation infinitely more solid than the shifting sands of me. For all of you punk rock Johns out there who aren't sure how much longer you can hold on, hang on for one more round. This book is written for you. All right, so James chapter one. Anybody want to read James 1? Blessed is the man who preserves under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from 
the Father, heavenly lights. He does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. All right, thank you. So according to James, who is the real threat to your faith? Yeah, that, that, that thing about when you point your finger at somebody else, you have how many fingers pointing back at you? Yeah, the real threat to your faith is you. The real threat to my faith is me. That's verse, was that third? 14. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. One of the definitions we use of sin, that we give of sin, is that we turn inward on ourselves. Have you heard me say that before? I hope so. Uh, Say that enough. We turn inward on ourselves and we're no longer focused outwardly, um, which in this case is a reference to where we should be turning, which is the word of God. Instead, we focus on ourselves. Also, when we're focusing on ourselves, we can't take care of who? Yeah, our neighbor which is, yeah, anybody else um, that is correct. So when we turn inward, when we are sinful beings, we can't do those things. And we need, we need the cross of Christ, as my daughter points to the cross on mom's t-shirt. Well done. So, you know, we need Jesus for this very thing, um, to deal away with this great threat that is us. That's the point of baptism, why we bring anyone to the font, whether they're a child or an adult. It's because there, your original sin, this turning inward is drowned, and it, yeah, then daily, as Luther talks about, we daily drown the old Adam within ourselves with, by the remembrance of our baptisms. It's why we have confession and absolution on Sunday morning and Thursday evenings. It's why we have the Lord's Supper together in this place so that that turned inwardness would be defeated, would be destroyed. And indeed, Christ does it. The only other note that I had to myself was that I wanted to read a paragraph from page 20 of the book. And I should have read it before we did question five. Um, As I look at this, sorry. Um, Pastor Fisk wrote, there is only one attack that the devil uses to destroy the church of Jesus Christ to remove Jesus. He does this by removing the way Jesus reigns, by removing Jesus' words. There's nothing new to this. He's been a liar from the beginning, but he always tells the same lies. We can learn them. We can discern them. We don't have to believe them. As the crow sweeps in to steal away the seed, we can recognize his call and learn to fight back by scattering the seed all the more. So, um, briefly, did you have any other thoughts or interesting quotes that you wanted to to bring up from your reading of the introduction? I found it interesting in in the Behold the Cow of God on page 18. He said one one of the lies is it's not your faith in God that's broken. He says, then it's Christianity. And I I have heard that before. I've heard people say, well, no, it's, it, it's, I have strong faith. I had, a, I had a wonderful faith, but Christianity let me down. Yeah. Christianity failed me. Christianity failed me. The church let me down. Um, just, yeah, just point out, you know, X example of this is what the church did to me when I was growing up or, or whatever it might be. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's unfortunately very common. Other things you wanted to bring up? Otherwise, we'll do a short preview of what next week is. And by short, I'll tell you what the rule is that you need to start breaking immediately. (laughs) All right, so never number one, which is what the chapters are gonna be titled the rest of the way, numbers one through seven. Uh, Never number one, never follow a rule that follows your liver, your heart, your pancreas, or any other bodily organ that could conceivably have its mind changed by the shifting of the wind. That's what we're talking about next week. He gets into all those other things because they didn't think that you thought with your, your mind, 
they had things different. We think we think here and we feel here. They thought we thought here and we felt here. So that's why he's going into all the others. Um, I know many of you don't have the book. Those of you that don't have it, have any of you ordered it already and just waiting for it? Okay. And you can get electronic versions of it too that are instantaneous and you don't even have to wait for shipping. Um, so there's, oh, technology gives us some useful tools these days. Um, otherwise, if you thought following along was, was easy enough this evening, you're welcome to continue to just follow along. I will continue to print out the study guide um, and provide those um, for you. It is, I recommend it, certainly recommend it to everybody to read this book, but most won't, even if I tell them to. So, um, other thoughts from people that didn't read the book? Bruce is interested, he's at least hooked, he's gonna buy it, so. All like 11 cents or whatever Pastor Fisk gets from that sale. I really have no idea how that, that works. But. All right, well thank you for coming this evening and um, there's seven chapters and a conclusion I think, so that kind of gives you an idea of how much longer we'll take to go through this. The chapters, chapters are decent length. Um, it's not like a five page chapter like some books. Um, these are full chapters, so um, don't save it for 7.30 on. Well, I guess we're doing this in the evening. Don't save it for five o'clock next Sunday night to read it. Um, you won't finish in time. But um, with that, why don't we close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful uh, for the gifts that you have given. First of all, the gift of creation that you made us, um, that you indeed have created us as your people and that you love us. And that in, above all, you have loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. Um, we, we thank you for the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of new life that are granted to us through the cross and the resurrection of your son. We pray tonight that you would protect us safeguard us from the lies of the devil um, as he tries to, to sway us away from your son by removing the word of Christ from us. Also, uh, protect us from our own evil desires, uh, the sinful flesh, um, and, and help to, to overcome that in us, daily drowning it through the reminder of our baptism, um, that we are your child and not a slave to sin. Um, we pray that you bless our weak be with us, um, help us to share this good news, scatter the seed um, with other people. We, we pray this again with thanksgiving in Christ's name, amen.